Welcome to episode 22 of the One Small Change podcast. On today's show, we have Angela Foster, one of the country's leading health and performance coaches, as well as host of the top-rated High Performance Health podcast. With a client list ranging from Formula One drivers to high-flying business CEOs, Angela trains and coaches high-performance individuals on how to drive success and productivity in their lives, but not at the expense of health, balance and spirituality. Angela's story is a fascinating one. After a successful and highly intense career in corporate law, Angela ended up being rushed to hospital following diagnoses of burnout, depression and eventually double pneumonia. And Angela describes this as her body's way of telling her she had to change her ways. This was the start of her journey to uncovering how uh, she could optimise every aspect of her mental and physical health. And Angela's incredible breadth of expertise is something that I'm particularly excited about on today's talk. She's got a knowledge of everything from nutrition to longevity, holistic health to high performance and productivity. So I'm very excited to take a real deep dive into these topics, many of which are big, big passions of mine as well, as the listeners will know. So Angela, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you, Simon. Thanks so much for having me on today. No worries at all. It's a, it's a lovely sunny day outside. I've, I've had to open the doors, so hopefully there's not too much bird noise in the background. We're both in Surrey today, aren't we? <laughs> we are, and it's beautifully sunny here. Yeah, I've yeah. been enjoying that. Yeah, me too, getting that sunshine in. So before the, uh, before the talk uh, today, we had a quick chat, and we were talking about biohacking. And I was asking you, are you a biohacker? How does biohacking fit into the way that you practice on day to day? And I'd really be interested for you to share your thoughts on that uh, and how what you do maybe is different from what people might know as biohacking uh, and how it works into your day to day life, really. Sure. So I think from our discussion, I'm very similar to you. I'm always looking at how can I get to where I want to go in the fastest way possible and minimize all the distractions and the guesswork along the way. And that's why I see biohacking is essentially, you know, we have life hacking, productivity hacking, people have heard and are familiar with that. But biohacking is really looking at how can we hack into our biology and we're all unique and into that bio individuality to really up level our results and actually control to a degree our epigenetic outcomes and enhance both our health and our performance. So I use biohacking as a part of um, my strategies really um, to to help get people those results and and help them perform at the highest level. Brilliant. And I mentioned, I'm going to come back to that epigenetic word that you used a second there because that's something that I'm really, really interested in. But I'd love to start off by hearing a bit about your, your journey to getting to where you are today. And for some reason, this every I don't know this necessarily before finding my my guests, but it seems to be a common theme that my guests have all had this big transitional moment. It, my podcast is called One Small Change, but it seems like everyone's making one big change um, to get to these big passion um, careers. But you were a corporate lawyer um, in investment banking, I understand, and then you had this big change in your life where now you've you've moved into a completely different career. Um, Tell us more about that. Tell us about that time in your life and and whether it was a difficult decision or, or a very obvious decision at that stage because of the, the presentation of, of the symptoms that you had and, and everything around that. Yeah, sure. So as you said, you know, I started life out um, or my adult life as a corporate lawyer working really hard in London um, at one of the big fresh reels, one of the big law firms there. And um, I was working across multiple time zones. We completely, as lawyers, we, we did burn the candle at both ends, a bit like uh, medical, you know, doctors and dentists, and I just had fun. It was work hard, play hard mentality. But then it was always, you'll do anything basically to get the transaction through because in mergers and acquisitions, you know, you've got high paying clients and they want results. And so you might have, a, you know, something land on your desk at, you know, 5 p.m. on a Friday and then you've got to work all weekend um, and just to get it through. And then the deal can change again. And so there's a lot of night sacrificed. I think we completely disrespect sleep, which is one of the big things when I sort of take clients through my shift protocol. Um, because it really, I think that was what set the stage for bur- the burnout that was to come. So during that period, I was always pretty into fitness and nutrition. You know, I was fueling my body in, in a reasonably healthy way. And I was exercising a fair amount, um, albeit sometimes at three o'clock in the morning, doing crazy <laughs> things like going to the gym at 3 a.m. While a, while a document's being typed for me to review. So it was all a bit, a bit crazy. But what I found really hard was when I then came to combine that lifestyle with children, that felt really impossible. And shortly before that, I'd had 
my first kind of brush with health when I wanted to start a family and I, or I was thinking of doing it and I found that I had PCOS and endometriosis and was prescribed um, metformin to control blood sugar. Um, didn't get on with that at all as a medication, found it almost impossible to take. And so I started sort of diving into the nutritional world and thinking, well, actually, how can I better control my blood sugar? There was a strong family history of type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease and also heart disease. And I wanted to avoid those outcomes. And, you know, in my late 20s with that diagnosis, I felt like I was perhaps going the same way. So that was my first sort of foray. And I was very fortunate insofar as I then managed after surgery to conceive my first child and go on to have another two completely naturally. But at the same time, I was going for partnership and I'd, you know, spent a, a done a stint at an investment bank, realized that wasn't going to work. The in-house job wasn't really any better than private practice. So I'd moved to a large firm still, but it was outside of London thinking I could combine the two. And I sort of had this approach of, well, I'll try and, you know, start a family because I've been told after surgery the endometriosis will regrow within about six months. So now's kind of your best chance just at the time that I'm going for partnership. So I was kind of like, well, do you know what? Normally I'd go for one goal or the other, but we'll try both and see which one happens first. <laughs> so that was kind of the strategy. And then I very fortunately, having sort of done, I guess, what is a bit of biohacking, but I didn't know it at the time, fell pregnant very quickly. And so then made partnership while I was eight months pregnant, um, shortly before going off on maternity leave. And that was when things were unexpected started to happen. So I did suffer with postnatal depression, although I was completely in denial. I was like, this doesn't happen to me. I'm fine with no sleep. You know, I've done so many of these. Um, and then I was sort of told by my gynecologist that actually having my second child reasonably close would also help that endometriosis from not regrowing. Um, and pregnancy is a wonderful quick cure for endometriosis. So I duly did what he said. And I was three months pregnant by the time I was due to go back from maternity leave, wow. which was all a bit crazy. So within yeah. 18 months, these two boys around um, <laughs> and life was a bit mental. They weren't the best sleepers. They all had reflux. Oh, and uh, so I was trying to manage. But during that second pregnancy, I realized that something deeper was going on within me and that the depression, actually, I was, I was depressed all the way through that pregnancy. But I had my second son and thought, I'm going to take a bit of a career break, see what happens, and I'll kind of get through this on my own. And it wasn't until he was eight months old and my husband took some time off work that I um, basically found I couldn't get out of bed until sort of three o'clock in, in, the, in the afternoon. And that was very, very unlike me. I'm very much a 5 a.m. riser. And so I then did what all kind of, I guess, type A personalities would do is phone up my doctor and say, I must be anemic. There must be something here. <laughs> yeah, Fix it, please. Do some bloods. There's something going on. Why is this, you know, this doesn't happen to me. And she sort of gently said to me, I'll do, I'll run all the bloods, but likelihood is this is, we're looking at postnatal depression. And apparently I hadn't realized, but eight weeks and eight months are big kind of crash points for, for women postnatally. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. And so I kind of still ignored it. All the bloods came back fine until I was just really on my knees and sort of turned up at the GP, kind of shaking, just struggling to manage, really battling it. Um, and I received treatment for that. And that was kind of my first foray into really managing my mind because I hadn't looked at that. You know, I'd looked at the nutritional side of things, the exercise side of things, how to keep healthy. Running was a lifeline because it gave me the endorphins, but then running wasn't working anymore. And so I had a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy and I started to look at my thoughts differently and very much thought I am getting back on track here. And I thought I was. The, the doctors actually weren't very much in favor. It was a bit of a battle um, getting over that stint of depression um, in terms did, of did they want children. To, did they want to medicate it? Was that, was that the battle did, you were having? So, well, they did medicate it. I don't think I had. I got to the point where they were sort of pleading with me and I couldn't really do that in a work anymore. I was just, I think it becomes so physical as well mm. as mental depression. That was mm. my experience of it. So I agreed to medication just to be able to do the work, but I had to kind of have quite hefty doses of medication. I then managed to actually transition off it all and thought I felt much more in charge of my brain. So when I, we decided we wanted a third, um, I thought I've got this sorted. So we, you know, did all the things I was told to do, get a maternity nurse so you're not lacking in sleep. That apparently makes you more vulnerable if depression, postnatal depression. I was fine all the way through the pregnancy with my daughter. But the slide that happened after she was born was just so fast. And 
it was so it was so quick and I went into it so deeply that I really it took me a long long time to come through that and it that's where it got so bad and I think that's why I ended up so sick that resulted in me you know get, being under a psychiatrist at the priory being prescribed bipolar medication um, and basically told that I had major depressive disorder with possible sort of tripping into bipolar and that I'd be on meds for the rest of my life and I was really really struggling and the thoughts of suicide were just becoming you know so thick and fast that when the kids got ill they got a flu I then a cough really I kind of came down with a chest infection they kept treating it with repeated antibiotics I wasn't getting any better until then they said oh you've got pneumonia um there's crackles all on the left chest left lung sent me for an x-ray and then I was very quickly called into hospital for a CT scan because my lymph glands were so enlarged they thought that I had um, lung cancer. So they scanned me and, and discovered that actually, no, it was the pneumonia had spread to both lungs. It was viral and bacterial. And I was then, you know, admitted immediately into hospital, not able to say goodbye to the kids or when they got home from school, my oldest one, you know, where's mummy? I couldn't even say goodbye. They wouldn't let me go home. So it was all very, like things happened really fast. And I think like you were saying, like many of your guests, it's like a big event that happens that really jolts you and when I was in hospital, I do believe that the the high fevers I was having just gave way to a lucidity that gave me that kind of transcendental style experience where I really connected with my inner self. And I wasn't a meditator at this point. So although I'd done all the CBT and that kind of work, it was still very much down the sciencey, you know, route and traditional yeah. medical route. I hadn't done, I hadn't really forayed into spirituality. And so... I then kind of really connected with me and it was like a wake up call, like, what am I doing? Here I am thinking about suicide, thinking my kids are going to be better without me in their life, but not able to take the step because a massive part of me feels so guilty leaving them without a mother. And it was just a wake up call of like, you know, I was told I was neutropenic, you know, hooked up to drips on nebulizers and things. They thought they were going to end up having to intubate me. Fortunately, they didn't. And it was like, actually, what am I doing? Like, my kids need me. They need a mother. And that was the shift, um, the big shift that happened. But I wouldn't say it was an easy thing because after that, you know, it's then like, what are you going to do? So I then made a commitment to myself. Right, I'm going to rebuild my brain and body, whatever it takes. So I started, I guess, from a selfish perspective, thinking, well, how can I, how can I really get well? Then I started to get well you know, was retraining in nutrition. And then it was kind of like, how can you combine a healthy lifestyle with high performance? How, how is that even possible, right? Because the performance that I'd and the success I'd achieved as a lawyer always meant sacrificing my health. So I was like, how can we combine these two things? Um, and then I, over time, what I realized is that actually health is the foundation of sustained high performance, because otherwise, you're going to burn out. And I think, you know, you can have physical exhaustion where you'll get chronic fatigue and your physical health will go down. And you can have mental exhaustion where you can suffer with things like anxiety and depression. The unique thing about burnout is it is the combination of that mental and physical complete decline. And that's what happened with me. So it was like, how can I rebuild this? And the spiritual element, you know, we can talk about as well if you want to, whatever your listeners will will enjoy. But it was everything. It was that physical, mental and spiritual um, biohacking, I guess, or enhancement that really helped me to come through it. And it took a long time. I'm not saying it's an easy thing. And for anyone that's listening who struggles with depression, you know, it took me, my daughter is now nine and it took me, I have been medication free for about 18 months. So it's been a huge journey to come back. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. That was very, um, very open and honest. And it sounds like it was, I mean, it was, more more of a journey than I'd even realized doing my research on you that it sounds like it was um it was very I'm not surprised it was so transformative it sounds like it was a really tough thing to get through um there's so much I mean I've written down about five or six notes there of, of what you said there but um I, I guess let's start with um with what you do now then I mean how have you taken those skills that you learned through that process um and and when did they turn into your career? Because obviously, you, I imagine at that time, you were doing the hard work for yourself to get yourself through that difficult time. When did that then move into something that you felt, right, I'm actually at a stage now where I can, I can deliver this newfound knowledge that I have to help other people? 
Yeah, so I started working with clients initially on sort of a one-to-one basis, helping them. And then I realized actually that isn't the best way to help more people because obviously you run out of time pretty quickly. So that was when I then started to really think about my own methodology and put it into a format. So what I now do is I do take a, like a limited number of one-to-one clients, but I also run programs that help people make that shift. So I have I'm actually launching. So I had, um, I've got a product called Live Younger, which is all based around genetics and how to really help control that epigenetic expression and basically be younger next year because our genetics play a part, but we have more influence over them than we think. Um, And so I created a blueprint around that. And what I'm now doing is taking the work that I've done with high performance clients to actually really help people make the shift using what I call my shift protocol, um, which basically includes sleep as the first, which is the pillar. And these don't have to be done in any particular order. It's just that when you master your sleep, everything becomes easier. Um, So the first is sleep and, and how to really optimize that. And it isn't necessarily about sleeping longer because we don't, I think you and I were talking before the show that there aren't enough hours in the day when you really want to, you know, spend the time that you've got on this planet, really enjoying it and making the most impact. So it's more about how can you sleep smarter as well as much as anything else? And how can you align with your genetic chronotype? So are you an early morning type? Are you a night owl? You know, what kind of sleeper are you? Are you a light sleeper? Um, how do things like, for example, your comp gene work, which um, basically defines whether you're more of a sort of warrior type with an A or warrior with an O and how would that stress impact <laughs> you? So it's things like, like that, that that I'll look at. <laughs> Um, and we'll sort of dive into, and then the second can you be, can you, can you be both? Can you be a warrior and a warrior? (laughs) Yeah, you can be a mixed type. And actually in the military, that mixed type works better because in leadership positions, because what they find is those individuals actually have an appreciation of risk, but they, they, it's not so much that they can't handle that pressure. So they're sort of less vulnerable to PTSD. But then they aren't sort of gung ho and I guess more like me, where people like me who are the sort of the warrior with an A are more vulnerable to burnout because you don't have that appreciation of stress. You know, there's positives and negatives. Like for me, I have to really impose deadlines or I'm probably going to get not very much done because unless there's pressure, I need that pressure to perform. But then at the same time, you can just take on way too much and you can burn yourself out. So there's sort of moderation. So that's really kind of the biohacking element is looking at these things and helping clients to really understand and master themselves. And then the second pillar is the hormones. Um, And the hormones apply to both men and women and the way that interacts with stress. Um, as well because that can really impact our sex hormones and also how we show up in terms of motivation um, as well and so we look at that and things like hunger hormones just hormones is kind of its own area and then the eye is really the insights and that's where I tackle kind of the biohacking so we might look at you know a lot of data and very science driven so both in terms of labs but at home tracking And then the last two pillars really are the fueling and the training of how can you best fuel your body and mind and how can you train both your body and mind. And that's where the physical side comes in, but also the spiritual side. I love it. Well, I mean, I know we've only got an hour today, so I'm going to have to try and condense some of those down because they're all massive, massive topics. I think the interesting thing from what you said there is I definitely think I'm a, I'm a warrior with an A in the way that I, I go into everything and say yes to everything um, to try and, as you say, maximize life and, and make the most of, of the life's experiences has to offer then I will be warrior with a, with an O and worry about everything before and after I actually do it, <laughs> which is the interesting thing with that. Um, but I, I, I'd love to, I think probably the, the overview or the one theme running through all of those points of the shift pattern is data, both from a genetic analysis point of view and from a, a day-to-day tech point of view. So why don't we delve into those two points a little bit? How are you analyzing your clients or people that work with you uh, how are you analysing their genetics? Are you taking bloods? Are, they, are you making analysis of the genome from that? How does it all work from a genetic Yeah, point? so the genetics are really easy. So it's just saliva, so it can be done at home. It's just literally okay. a mouth swab, and we can get a huge amount of data um, from that um, in terms of kind of sequencing their whole sort of exome. So then you can find out... Um, 
of just everything about how they feel their body as well. So what's their carbohydrate sensitivity? You know, are they more vulnerable to blood sugar highs and lows? A bit like me, I'm very carb sensitive. And that was obviously playing out for me in the early days when I had insulin resistance before I got it under control. But people, it's not just for people listening, it's not just actually how does that affect what you're eating in your health, but it also affects your energy and your performance. Because if you're more vulnerable to blood sugar spikes, Um, then with carbohydrate based foods, you're also more likely to energy swings in the day and food cravings and things like that. So you're never going to perform that well unless you've got your blood sugar under control. Um, and, and, you know, controlling your blood sugar and your keeping inflammation low are probably the two pillars, as you know, in terms of helping with longevity. If we can control those two things, we're going a long way to living longer and living younger. Um, but you can also see your fat sensitivity. So people will, you know, the ketogenic diet is really, really popular. But then is that right for that individual? How do they process fats? What's, how do they process saturated fats? And what proportion of fats can they have in their diet? But also, what sex are they? You know, are they male or female? Because if they're female, actually going on things like the ketogenic diet that is very, it's a form of elimination diet, can actually, I've seen, you know, it play havoc with women's hormones, particularly in perimenopause, if they've, you know, particularly done dirty keto, but if they're not balancing it out with lots of green leafy vegetables that enhance those detoxification pathways and support the detoxification of things like excess estrogen. So it's what, what's, always this... What's dirty keto out of interest? Sorry, I haven't heard so that So it's just where before. you go, the dirty keto is more where it's that sort of, you know, you're going to have bacon every day for breakfast and you can right. have these recipes where you make sort of fat bombs and it's all based around fat, but without much attention to quality. And I don't think many people are doing that as much now. It tends to be more, I think I would favor the keto green style diet where it's much more alkalizing on the body. You have got lots of leafy greens to support that um, balance. And you're also enhancing gut health and detoxification pathways. But again, like detox pathways, we can see that as well. You know, do does this individual at a genetic level lead either detoxification or methylation support? And so it sounds complex, but actually I teach this in the program and there's a series of videos that can help people really master it. So it's actually simpler than it sounds. And then they start to really feel much more energized um, and just feel all around better and they perform better because their brain now is fueled in the right way. They've got enhanced cognition, you know, speed of thinking, memory. Um, So everything that I do is really with the angle of how can I make you better at achieving your goals. If you have a particular fitness goal alongside that, which some people do, then that's great. But that should be sort of for your enjoyment that you want to do that. Whereas the most of what I tend to do is how can we actually optimize your health so that you're better at your job or being an entrepreneur or business owner or even a parent. Um, So yeah, it's all kind of designed with that lens. That definitely sounds perfect for me. Um, and um, and the second thing uh, was the data tracking on a day to day. I see that you've got an Apple Watch on there. Um, what what tech is there? Is there specific pieces of tech that you recommend? Uh, is it Apple Watch? Is it Whoop bands? Is it Aura rings? Is it any of the above? Does it not really matter? Um, what are your thoughts on that from a specific level? Because I, I I love I love tech and I'll buy everything if if I don't get a direction. If you don't. So do you know what's interesting is the Apple Watch I was actually putting on earlier for time because I don't tend to use that much and I usually will put it into airplane mode because I actually don't like it beeping at me and I don't like the radiation. What I do use more is this this Aura ring. I don't know if you've come across Aura. I have, and yeah. a, You have, and a whoop strap, which is charging at the moment. So I tend to use those much more just because of the way that they're able to track data. I think the reliability is better. So Aura, I find, and I often get asked by people, which do I prefer? And I've been comparing them both. I've been a long-term Aura user, but over the last six months, I've been comparing it with Whoop. And I think for more athletic clients, I think Whoop can give you really good data on your strain. Um, Aura has a readiness score. And this is really important because these these things can give you insights, particularly for people like ourselves who will push too hard, is how well are you recovering? So looking at a metric known as heart rate variability is really important. So the heart, as you know, is not designed to beat like a metronome. So if someone has a heartbeat of 60 beats per minute, it's not going to be one beat per second. There's actually quite um, 
if they're healthy, a good degree of interbeat variability. And by tracking that overnight, we can actually see how good is that, how well is that client recovering from their overall stress bucket. So their stress at work, family life, relationships, and also the exercise that they're doing. And if we start to see that dropping by, and I like to use the kind of athlete terminology here, because I think it's very useful for people, is we want to be overreaching, but we want to functionally overreach. That's what athletes do. So if you're functionally overreaching, you are called Causing strain on the body to make it stronger and more robust and perform better. It's a bit like make, breaking down muscle fibers when you're weight training, or actually making that stronger, that muscle stronger. Whereas if you go too far, you can actually dip into overtraining, and that again takes you down that burnout road that I was on, and um, it's much harder to come back from. So if we see someone's heart rate variability dropping by about twenty percent from their established baseline. We know that now we need to put a little bit more recovery in, whereas if it drops 40%, we have actually gone too far. So we need to bring that up. And it's a really good independent metric because people who are high performers often will, they know that they have to do, I guess, the distinguishing factor between a high performer and somebody who is performing more averagely is that a high performer does the things that other people don't want to do. And so they have that mindset of pushing themselves to do it. But then what we want to make sure is that they're not, as we say, overtraining effectively in life, because if we can see that data, then they are vulnerable to burnout. So it's a really useful and independent metric of, am I not doing this just because I don't feel like it? Or is it actually that, no, I have been pushing too high, up too hard, sorry, and now I need more recovery. And I think building recovery cycles into your day um, is as important as taking a break, you know, holiday or getting good sleep at night. It's super important. So we always wanna stress, recover, stress and recover. With women, where it becomes a bit more complicated is we'll track other things. So we'll track body temperature. With men, I'll do breathing rate as well. But also with women, we want to, with menstruating women, we want to, that infradian rhythm is really useful biomarker of their health. And also aligning with their female physiology gives them better results. So it isn't, you know, with men, it's this, and, and society's kind of been created around this 24 hour clock. And so it's always like push hard, recover. Um, and that's based almost around the testosterone cycle, right? It's high in the morning, we're all like really motivated, get up and go, and then it sort of tapers off in the afternoon. But that's not the same for women. The infradian rhythm is much more complex. And so they actually need to be looking at it more on a 28-day basis if they really want to unlock high levels of creativity and high performance. So we'll look at data like that and track alongside and things like Aura and Whoop and use other apps. There's really exciting stuff coming on to the market at the moment. Also, for example, like you can track blood sugar at home. Often I'll put a continuous blood sugar monitor on, on clients and I can actually see their data and see what's happening in real time. So we can look at, well, actually, how do they respond to this food? You know, how well is their blood sugar stable at night? Why are they waking up in the middle of the night? Is it a cortisol response? Because actually blood sugar is dropping too low. So there's a huge amount of stuff, which is, and I think, you know, what I find is people get quite addicted to it, but it's a healthy addiction because you can get so much information. It's fascinating. Um, and I think, I, I, as I say, I, I keep on saying that I want, to, I want all that data. I think my only concern, I think the reason why I pulled back from some of these things is I have an anxiety over where my data is going. And that's probably an, an, an irrational uh, sensitivity towards that um, because I'm sure it is anonymized. But I think that's my only, because I've been looking at Aura Ring for many, for many, many years now. I've recently been looking at Whoop Bands. I know you had Dan Murray Serter on. Um, who's a good friend of mine, CEO of Heights. He was on my podcast as well. He's a big fan of the Whoop Band. Um, uh, so yeah, it's um, it's really exciting to see the data becoming more accurate with a less invasive analysis because I think that's been the difficulty before. You could have accurate and invasive or inaccurate and non-invasive, but now it seems like they're getting uh, to the, the, the sweet spot in the middle there. Yeah, and I think they're gathering a lot of data. So I do. I think it is anonymized. And I think, you know, with good companies like that, we can be, I guess, more confident with the standard of confidentiality and data protection. Mm. Um, but I think they're still a long way off from being really accurate. I remember seeing Matthew Walker, who wrote Why We Sleep in London, and he was wearing an aura ring and asking him the question, you know, how do you think aura compares to sleep lab data? 
Mm. Um, and he was like, well, I think it's probably the best that we have available at the moment, which is why I wear it, but it's probably only about 60% accurate, or it was then. And I'm sure it's come on, that was over, eight, well, more than a year ago because we've had all the lockdowns. But he, um, one thing that is important, I think, and he made that point, is that the benefit is that you're tracking it against yourself. So you are seeing, you know, uh, the comparative data baseline. from last night to the night before yeah. exactly it's your own baseline and i think from that perspective and when now i've compared the two what i do see is they do actually marry up quite well okay. in terms of definitely for hrv they're very very similar um i think the rem sleep and the deep sleep are a little bit off at times between the two devices but again still very similar so that gives me further confidence in terms of the accuracy of the data really interesting yeah i i do um in my in my other day job as a dentist um i do um help patients with airway issues and and things like sleep apnea so i'm i'm fairly uh well versed in things like ahi and and airway analyses um airways a massive topic i mean the the impact of breathing well um i think you've had some people talking about breathing before on your podcast haven't you but the 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 prevalence sorry if you can hear my son there um the uh, the prevalence of sleep apnea is baffling i think there's a billion people with undiagnosed sleep apnea um and the impact of that's having on their medical status the uh, just one i'm going a bit off tangent here but one statistic that i read was that as a smoker you've got a five times increased risk of having a heart attack if you have sleep apnea you've got a 25 times risk uh, increased risk of having a heart attack because uh, your your body is just constantly being stressed as you sleep uh, because you're basically asphyxiating. So yeah, so uh, anything that I think that can help to make that analysis better, as you say, with a more accurate baseline instead of s sending someone in for a sleep study for one night or two nights is going to be um, really, really beneficial for all of us, I think, isn't it? And on that, actually, um, Simon, what I notice is Whoop will pick up on those micro wake ups much more than Aura. Will it? So you'll see these red lines. And, you know, I actually had a client some years ago where I looked at him on, on, on Whoop and literally it was like these micro wake ups continuously. Mm. I'd never seen so many. And I said to him, you need to go and see your doctor because the, the likelihood is there's sleep apnea. We wouldn't normally see that many. So as you say, yeah, they can be kind of a life saving thing. Yeah. yeah hopefully hopefully that's uh, people are all, I, know, I know i've already been negative about technology saying that data is being shared but um hopefully technology will be at the um at the dramatic benefit of all of our medical statuses one thing i'm interested about i always say to my wife i'm gonna live till i'm 150 and she laughs in my face um i'm interested you've clearly done significantly more research on on all of these topics than i have how old do you think you're gonna live till so, do you know, it's interesting, isn't it? So, when you look at someone's genes, do they have a genes that are kind of, they're likely to live longer? I think there is that. And I see it show up in people's reports. Um, I think the way you live your lifestyle can enhance it. But then none of us ever know, right? There could be an event that completely takes you out. Um, a bit like happened to me. Um, I don't personally set a date that I want to live to or an age I want to live to. Because for me, I want to live as long as I can in the best state of health that I can. And still, like I don't, I'm not somebody who ever thinks of retiring, for example. I want to continue to share my message with the world and to hopefully make other people's lives healthier for as long as I possibly can and to show up as the healthiest and best version of myself. If we look at how long people can live, people don't really get past at the moment 120. And I, you know, I was in, I interviewed, it's actually coming out tomorrow, Dave Asprey, Oh, wow. about his quest to awesome. live <laughs> and that was really interesting and he's done so much I think he spent like two million dollars on it so far and having complete full body stem cell treatment and things like that and I think he believes that yeah we can easily sort of get to not easily but if we do the right things we can get to 120 so can we with now with technology nudge on to sort of 140 160 plus we haven't we haven't got anything to show that yet have we we don't have good evidence of people doing it um, I think that the more things that you can do that enhance your longevity genes, that enhance those pathways in the body and the better you can support it. But the reality is as well, we are constantly bombarded with toxins and things in our environment. And I think our body adapts. But, you know, there's something like 80,000 chemicals released into the into the atmosphere every year. 
And we've only tested about 5,000 of them on humans. So we actually don't, we are part of one big experiment at the moment, regardless. And I think our bodies are quickly trying to catch up. Um, but there are lots of things that you can do to enhance that and to protect you from a lot of the lifestyle diseases that we're seeing in the form of cancer, heart disease and, you know, and diabetes. One thing that seems clear when we look at the blue zones, which are these sections across the world where they have the, you know, the highest number of centenarians and super centenarians. Yeah, Okinawa and yeah, exactly. Sardinia. And Sardinia is that they don't seem to live longer once they have a disease. They just don't get diseases until much later in life. So once you've experienced you know, one of those chronic diseases, I think that without significant advancements, you may continue to live longer. And we seem to be quite good at doing that, but on a heavily medicated basis. That's the issue, isn't it? Whereas what we really want to do, and that's why I think it's so important for people to start all this really young, is to actually prevent this in the first place. That's your real ticket to living longer. And so as a part of that, do you subscribe to... I'm interested to know your feelings on supplementation and I'm sure you're going to say that it's highly bespoke and not something that can be generically disbanded amongst uh, the whole population. Um, but I'd, I've done, I, I'm just looking at this here. I've, I've bought this recently, uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, um, after hearing, uh, of all people, Russell Kane talk about it on Stephen Bartlett's podcast. Um, and it's to do with, my understanding is to do with, with your DNA and with, telomeres and and is it telomere shortening that is linked with aging and it's meant to reduce the risk of that other things like rapamycin and these sort of things i know have got some what's starting to be fairly good animal data on uh, on enhancement of life do you subscribe to any of those or, or recommend any sort of generic prescriptions to your clients i know the answer is probably yeah. going to be no but <laughs> I tend not to, yeah, I tend not to generically because I do get a lot of data from them. So if I'm working like personally with them, then we can actually see what they really, really need. Mm. Um, I do think things like NMN, you know, they do show um, promise, definitely. Um, I think the more that we can, and things like, you know, resveratrol and quercetin, you know, mm -hmm. all these things that enhance those pathways within the body, I think show a lot of promise. And I do take, um, not always, but on the rotation, quite a few different supplements like that myself um i think that for a lot of people they can feel unaffordable not necessarily in the short term but in the longer term and i guess what i would say to people is none of these things really are going to make a significant difference if you haven't already got the basics right yeah in terms of you know you sleep your training the way you fuel your body and fueling your body isn't just about what you eat or you put in or how long you fast, for example, which helps autophagy. There's a lot of things like that you can do for free. But I use the acronym FLOW because it's food, light, oxygen and water. And I think people underestimate the light, oxygen and water part. And you were talking about that with breathing, but the way you breathe makes such a huge difference to your health. Even just mm -hmm. nasal breathing and the production of nitric oxide and, you know, helping with blood vessels and and blood pressure, I think is so important. And, you know, light is bio, you know, we have so many forms of bioactive light in humans. If people aren't getting outside, you can get that free from the sun. You can also invest in things like infrared saunas, which have great, you know, well-researched and documented science behind using that to protect cardiovascular health. So I think mm -hmm. it's about putting everything together. And I think getting the basics right, offsetting some of the static charge that we're getting from all this electricity and, you know, going out and earthing, getting barefoot on the ground, exposing yourself to infrared spectrum from the sun, you know, really fueling your body in the right way. And then these are nice things to layer on top. But I... I like people to do as many of those free strategies first. Everyone loves the sexy biohacks because they're fun, right? That's yeah. the thing. And the stuff. The, ma the magic pill <laughs> to solve it all. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but then we kind of have to be careful, don't we? Like, I'm always conscious with clients. I don't want to recommend a huge long list of supplements because then, kind of like the doctor that's just prescribing pills, it's just another form. So yeah. it's sort of lifestyle medicine, I guess, first. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to pick out one little element that you described there, which is saunas, because this is something that I've been looking at for a long time. And as you say, I think that the evidence coming out of places like Finland, where sauna is is part of their um, part of their culture, um, and although the studies, it's very very difficult to look at studies over such a long period and control variabilities uh, or variables in these studies, but 
I think most people are now saying that actually, yeah, saunas are really, really quite a powerful tool that we can add into those things that you've mentioned around diet and exercise and meditation. It sort of fits into that as well. I do want to dive into the details on sauna. You mentioned infrared there. Um, that's the one that obviously is, is, is what you would recommend. Is, is that as opposed to something like a traditional, I don't, there's a dry sauna and a wet sauna, right? Like, and, and with regards to frequency and the amount of time that you spend in there, how do you, how do you fit it into your routine? Yeah, so I think any sauna is going to be good. So you're heating up the body and you're increasing detoxification. I think some of the scientific reports behind infrared show that it's kind of got the edge in that respect. And like I have an impulse sauna at home, which combines different infrared spectrums. Okay. So how do I M- do that? Impulse was that? Sorry. Impulse by Sunlight. And they've done okay. a lot of studies. They're very low EMF. They don't use any chemical treatment in the wood of the sauna. Um, and they, I think that they're one is very very good and how do i integrate it i would go in there because what the studies show is ideally you get into the sauna four times a week that tends to be the sweet spot um so i would work in there i can't i find meditation i'll meditate in front of my red light but meditating in a sauna gets very difficult very quickly because it's hard to be fully present as you start to sweat more and more and the heat does become intense however i will take my laptop in there and get some work done because that way you know, I'm a huge fan of stacking your hacks in that sense. So that's how I really fit everything in is, you know, I'll meditate in front of my red light. Then I can get a red light therapy session done and meditation. And then I might work in my sauna, for example, and then take a cold shower. Then you're exposing yourself to the cold as well. I think all these things are amazing. I would say with with certainly with the, the sauna I have, I think the studies they've done show that 20% of that sweat is um, is detox, is things coming out. And what they've noticed is with, you know, patients, for example, that have had chemotherapy, you can get quite a milky substance that come out. The sweat isn't actually clear. So I think it can be really helpful. But I think people, you can then start to biohack your sauna, right? You can take things that it really increase the heat in the body. And I think people just need to be aware that you are releasing toxins. And so you need to make sure that you are taking that sweat off very quickly with a towel and then going into the shower so you're not getting any reabsorption. You still want to make sure your gut health is good, right? So that you are using that passage of elimination as well. Um, But that's really how I do it is I tend to stack these things. I pretty much plan my week from a Sunday and I am kind of quite, I guess what I know about it, like most of my time, I'd say 80% of my time, my diary or more, 90% is by the half an hour is tracked out what I'm going to do to make sure I get the things that I want in and just being a little bit creative like that and then listening to podcasts like yours while I'm either out for a run or a walk. Do you see what I mean? I think yeah. you can just stack these things together. Absolutely. And, and I think you have to because there's just not enough time, is there? <laughs> no, it's true. Um, Very true. And, and with the infrared sauna, you can control temperature, right? Is there is there a specific temperature that you feel that you need to get to to get the output because there's my understanding is there's also as well as that detoxification and that sort of expression of these toxins out of the body heat shock proteins is another thing that's being activated by this sauna activity which potentially is another pathway that's helping with cardiovascular health and and that sort of thing yeah Exactly. So you have the benefit of the heat shock proteins and also as well, like the infrared is giving you that sort of you're getting that bioactive light that you would be getting from the sun, but without the UV light. And it's obviously not a replacement because Mm. we do need to go. We're not going to make vitamin D in a sauna, for example. So we do want to get outside in the natural light. So there's lots of different benefits that you you know, the infrared is really the extra thing that you're getting with an infrared sauna compared to, as you say, a dry heat or a wet heat. However, the temperature tends to be higher on those saunas. So those hot rock saunas tend to go a lot higher. And it's just a different way because on those, you're heating the environment that you're in Mm. and it's very, very hot. And some people can find that quite, they can feel quite breathless. Whereas with the infrared, you're heating the body from the inside out. So you become progressively hotter as you're in it. Very similar to when you go out in the sun. Um, So you can actually often take, you don't need it as hot um, and you can stay in there a bit longer. Okay. Um, 
And then you don't, on those saunas, obviously you don't have the red light. That's the critical difference. Whereas you are getting, if you've got a full spectrum one, you will get the far and the mid and the near infrared if you have full spectrum. But then I'll use the red light device that I have, which is the near infrared and the red, because that's amazing for healing injuries. It's amazing for helping with collagen production, um, you know, joint health. It's amazing for your mitochondria. So they've been using it in, you know, brain injuries and things like that and enhancing your mitochondria in the brain, but also the body. So I think they all have their benefits and it can feel overwhelming for people, you know, when they start, which is why I would say, let's try and get all the natural things in place first. And then you can start adding these in. Red light is eminently more affordable and easy for people to use because you can even have a target light. Um, you know, if people want to sort of repair an injury or they want to have the anti-aging benefits on their face. Um, and I think it's actually being used, isn't it, red light now in dentistry as well for healing. Yes. Um, so we uh, I don't have it any more, actually, but I did have something called an ATP 38, which actually um, it rotates through a number of different wavelengths of light to help with healing. Um so uh yeah that's that's something that's being brought in now uh photobiomodulation is the um is the physiological process happening there so it, it's something that's being studied within dentistry and medicine um quite heavily i think um so that's that's exciting to see so um you mentioned mitochondrial health there uh and i when i was doing my research on you i saw that was a theme that came up a couple of times in in some of your podcasts um why what what's the role of mitochondria firstly for those that don't know and, and, and why is it so important and how can we help to maintain it yeah so mitochondria help us produce atp that's what they do and and, and they are important they're like the energy powerhouses of our cells so they're really important that we have good quality mitochondria but also the right number of them and red light therapy is one way of enhancing mitochondrial health what you don't want to do is the more kind of toxicity that you have, the poorer your diet, eating things like, you know, what's really common in the UK is it's very difficult to find any form of processed food that doesn't have vegetable oils in it. These are damaging to your mitochondria. You know, things like rapeseed oil is kind of prolific now. Any mayonnaise you pick up, um, any biscuit, any cook, anything pretty much will have that in there. And those oils are highly oxidized and can be damaging to the health of your mitochondria and your cellular membranes. So it's about really looking around and sort of cleaning up things that you're eating and just paying more attention to what you're doing so that you can enhance the health of your mitochondria. You can do specific training, for example. You know, sprint training has been shown to enhance the health of mitochondria. But then what you don't want to do is do it for too long. So it's sort of short start, sharp sprints with longer recoveries on a kind of one to four, or one to eight ratio of exercise to recovery has some um, good scientific studies behind it that, that can actually help with mitochondrial health. Um, and what we're finding in the research is ongoing is that so many of these diseases that we're seeing as well are linked to mitochondria. Um, but if you, you know, if you're struggling with energy, that's definitely one of the places to start looking at because it can really make you feel quite you know, if you if you've a lot of diseases are mitochondrial thought to be mitochondrial diseases, um, it can really affect how you feel dramatically. Fascinating. And so the the red light that you spoke about is a separate red light because I've seen I think I've seen you meditating in front of it. It's a separate red light to the red lights that you're getting through the infrared sauna. What what's the exact brand of that of that red light that you're using? I use the one by Red Light Rising. Um, red light there's rising. a big. Um, okay manufacturer in the US called Juve. The red light rising um, are medical grade lights, but they have zero flicker. So um, it might be an interesting podcast uh, guest for you, actually. Simon is their founder, James Strong. And so he, he really um, went to a lot of trouble to create a very high quality device. Um, and they out. have, yeah, and, and they don't have, they have zero flicker. And the thing with the flicker is that you're, you may not be aware of the flicker, but your brain is, so it might not be registering. And that actually, it causes downtime in the light. So you'd have longer treatment times if there's flicker, but also that is an imperceptible stress on your brain. So you don't have that. Um, so that's the one that I use and they do them in all different kind of sizes mm. um, in terms of how much of the body you want to target. But they're very efficient because you only need to spend about seven or eight minutes really in front of it. Brilliant. Okay, I, I'm aware we've got very little time left, unfortunately. So I'm going to try and pull as much value out of you for, as possible for the listeners. Um, 
if you had to condense down three top tips for enhanced productivity in a way that was respectful of health and all of the things that we've talked about today, what would they be? So the first one would be um, really optimize your sleep because your sleep is going to give you so much better productivity. It, it pays huge, huge dividends. And by that, I don't necessarily mean sleeping longer. You know, I'm not somebody who sleeps that long. I tend to, I genetically need less sleep um, than some people. But for example, I would sleep six and a half to seven hours, but I'm very same focused on how, is that the same as you? Yeah. yeah. I'm very focused on the quality of that sleep. So getting access to the morning light and then restricting access to light in the evening and the timing of your meals are the two biggest cues that we have to the circadian clock. So the earlier you go out in the morning, probably the earlier you're going to fall asleep that night. So you can play with that. But, you know, melatonin, which helps us to sleep and cortisol, which helps us to get going in the morning, have an inverse relationship. So we want higher cortisol in the morning and lower melatonin and the opposite at night. And so I'll wear, for example, blue light blocking glasses in the evening. I do have experimented with a range of different supplements from things like magnesium through to mushrooms i've been taking like reishi and chaga i found really yeah. actually helped to enhance Re my sleep reishi tea i'm a big big fan of i use the four sigmatic tea i don't, oh, know, yeah. if you, I don't know if you've tried that one but it's uh, I have, yeah. my wife and i, I are hooked on it <laughs> oh yeah yeah i love that i was having their lion's mane because obviously yeah, the neurological for focus. benefits yeah for focus and also like you know nerve growth factor and building new neurons because genetically i do have the outs carry one copy of the alzheimer's gene so i think oh, wow. that puts me at a 30 percent risk so that is a biggie for me but i tend to tincture them actually under the tongue in a sort of um, alcohol tincture and just hold it there and they absorb um so that's another way you can do it so i think sleep would be the first thing because if you if you really optimize your sleep, you're going to be more productive and you're going to be less vulnerable to these energy highs and lows and the sugar cravings and you really are protecting your brain. So much happens in sleep in terms of that respect. The second thing would be to look at the, what you're eating and the way you're moving. So I think that creating movement breaks throughout the day, the more movement you have, the more blood flow you have, the better you're going to concentrate. So having those recovery breaks where you actually go and get up and do something, and it might be some gentle stretching, it might be walking around, um, it might even be doing something more intense, like a quick Tabata workout, which is kind of four minutes, um, just to really recharge your batteries. And it will depend on the day on your recovery as to how intense that would be. But taking those regular breaks is really important. And I minimize, nutritionally, I always minimize carbohydrate intake during the day I tend to save my carbs for night just because I find that that really like exacerbates that post-lunch slump so if you want all day productivity I tend to fast for women it's a bit different I think men do super well with a 16 hour fast I think for women it's probably 12 to 14 without you know they can go longer but you just need to watch your hormones um, and then lay off the carbs during the day and then the, the other thing is just planning it. People really underestimate the value of actually planning your schedule. And for me, it's kind of, if it's in the calendar, it's going to happen. And you'll make everything you want to make, like we were talking, mm. if you scheduled it. And even scheduling that fa really important family time in, um, I think is key as well. So those would be my three top ones. Brilliant. Love it. Yeah. It's sch scheduling in the family time is, is uh, so, so important. And as someone who's just had their second child, as well as launching a podcast and, and, and a startup at the same time, it, it can be very difficult to, um, to fit that in. And I'm sure that's relatively common in a lot of your clients um, is, is struggling to find that balance between productivity and those deep, deep connections, which are probably more important in many ways for, for finding peace and balance. Yeah, it is one of the many challenges. And I think, you know, beyond that, we can, you know, you can look at things like we were saying, like things like lion's mane that help with um, concentration, you know, um, but that's probably, we've probably run out of time. Even things like essential amino acids and creatine can help with focus. But I do think that scheduling your time and putting in the things you want to do first is the opposite of what most people think. They think, oh, I'll put all those things in after I've finished everything, mm. but you're actually never going to finish everything. So, and you'll get your work done faster if you've really prioritized because you've got those things to look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Put, yeah, putting exercise and meditation into my diary every day was one of the most important things I've ever done, I think. Mm. I think meditation is a huge productivity enhancer. Mm. I really do. I just think, I don't know about you, but on the days that I've skipped a meditation for whatever reason, 
maybe one of the kids woke me up, you know, even earlier or something. I notice it. I am not as, I don't have the same mental clarity and I don't have as good as emotional regulation. You know, you're more reactive, I find, if I haven't meditated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Angela, that was, that was a real joy. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm very, very passionate about a lot of the topics that you are. And I think I've unfortunately only got through about half of my questions, but we'll have to, um, We'll have to lock in a, a number two at some point in the future. But thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's been it's been eye opening. I have got to end with with one last question because it's the question I ask to all of my um, all of my guests. Um, what is the one small change that you've made that you wish you made earlier in life? You're only allowed looking one. Looking after, <laughs> yeah, it would be looking after my um, spiritual health. I think I had, you know, I paid attention to physical health. Um, and I think that that what we were talking about meditation, mindfulness, being present to the present moment, that's all we have is such a powerful thing. I think we spend too much time in the past and the future. And I think that connection with ourselves, with kind of source energy or God or whatever you want to call it, and with our relationships with others, but it would be connection is really what I'm talking about there. And that is that spiritual side to ourselves. I think it's I think it's really where it's at. Absolutely. And so easy for type A personalities to completely ignore that. I think I, I, it was Mo Gowda, I think, on my most recent guest who said, we're human beings, not human doings. And we always want to be doing everything, doing this, doing that. Actually, we just need to be sometimes uh, instead, which is um, a good place to end, I think. Um, thank you so much. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks so much. Bye. Pleasure.